Mel and Regina Mason are alums of Monterey Peninsula College. They're in our Lobo Hall of Fame. We are extraordinarily proud of them. The President's Award recognizes community leaders that have given outstanding service to the community and to our college. And so this year, with Mel and Regina, honoring them with this award is indeed our honor. It's mindful of the original purpose of this award, which is to symbolize that a great community college like Monterey Peninsula College can only exist with the great support of the communities we serve, all of the communities we serve. And Mel and Regina have done outstanding work, certainly most recently through the Village Project, but always through social mobility, uh, empowering the individual spirit and reminding people of the pride that they hold and their personal power and translating that into building a strong community and nation. I was born in a coal mining town in uh, Kentucky called Providence. Providence means God, I think, and uh, God, we felt as black people, probably didn't exist in Providence, <laughs> Kentucky, so uh, because it was at the uh, height of Jim Crow segregation. My father went to uh, World War II, and I, I was two years old when he came back. My dad had what well, we know we now call it PTSD, a post-traumatic stress disorder. Whatever treatment that they had at that time, African Americans coming back did not get that. My dad lost his mind for a country that hated him. He came back to the same conditions that um, that were there when he left. Those are the kind of factors I think that, that gave birth to um, me as a radical and as a revolutionary and as somebody that was going to go out and, and, and make a life of fighting for social justice. Seaside was military, everybody. My father was in the military. All of my friends' parents were military connected. My parents divorced when I was uh, five years old. And so I remember going from kind of like riches to rags because I had uh, seven siblings, and I remember my mother having to work three jobs to make ends meet. I got my knowledge around two of my idols. One was Harriet Tubman, and the other was Sojourner Truth. And during middle school, I had cultural enrichment after school and learned so much about black history. I had this Sojourner Truth poster, Ain't I a Woman? And that stayed on my bedroom wall throughout my entirety of school. <laughs> I came out here in 1956, I was 13 years old. And at the time, there was only one high school in uh, the Monterey Peninsula Unified School District, and that was Monterey. So I, I was not a student uh, when I was at Monterey High, and I'd never lie to people and tell them, oh yeah, you know, I was uh, a, a National Merit Scholar or something like that, I was anything but that. Uh, what I was in, at Monterey High School was a basketball player. I came to the Monterey Peninsula in 1957-58 school year to play basketball for MPC. I used to go and watch the Monterey High School game with the lightweights and there was this young player by the name of Mel Mason who was outstanding, better than the varsity guys. There were about 50 some odd colleges that wanted me right out of high school. But see, Bill McClintock early on was part of the recruitment of me to Monterey Peninsula College. In my opinion, Mel Mason is the greatest all-around basketball player in the history of the Monterey Peninsula. He averaged 21 points per game in the Coast Conference the first year he was at MPC. He was an All-American, All-Conference Player of the Year. Not only did he score, but he could rebound. I think he averaged 14 or 15 rebounds a game. But my first semester at Monterey Peninsula College was one of the hardest things that I ever went through. But I think that there was something innate in me that wanted to know and, and wanted to learn. I didn't know if I could learn. And so Monterey Peninsula College, for me, was the beginning of my academic career and, and in many respects, the rest of my life. We can
no longer allow those people that are elected by us to divide us against our Latino brothers and sisters, against our Jewish brothers and sisters, against our I have admired Regina for a number of years because she has what I think is a real gift. I've watched Regina interact with people in a small group and interact with people in a large group. And she has the ability to understand what will resonate with people. We fight for children, for parents. I happen to be the current president of the Monterey County branch in AACP. When you look at what contributions you and your culture have made, children of African ancestry never get taught that, never get to know that before slavery there was Africa. Some of the greatest learning institutions in the world were in Africa. In fact, when Alexander the Great went into Egypt, he stole the whole Egyptian library, and people looked to the Greek for wisdom and so on, but that came from Africa. I've broken down my choices to Oregon State, UC Berkeley, and USF, and I chose Oregon State University. So I, I meet with the coach in his office, and he pulls out this uh, scholarship form. So I sign the scholarship offer, and then he looks at it, and he folds it up, and he puts it in, in his drawer, and he, he locked it. He said, and now, he says, uh, I need to talk to you about what life's going to be like for you as a colored boy in Carvallis, Oregon. And my whole demeanor and everything just went down. Blacks were not supposed to be out after dark because, as he said, you know, people in Carvallis still are not used to colored people. <laughs> well, they apparently weren't. And so um, one night uh, I remember running out of cold cuts and I thought, well, there's a store that's just right, up, right, right down the street from my, uh, my place. And I'll just run down there, get some cold cuts and come back. So he calls me in the next day and he tells me that, uh, you know, uh, he's not going to put up with me uh, being disobedient. In other words, we had two sets of rules. So I decided, despite all of this stuff here, I'm still going to graduate from Oregon State University in two years. Yes, I, I'm planning to turn pro. I think I'm good enough to do that. I'm going to take classes every year in summer school. So that's what I did. I get the phone call from this same person, screaming and yelling, what are you doing taking classes? And I said, because I want to graduate after two years. He said, who in the hell ever told you that you were a student? And so he's screaming and yelling. He said, I want you to drop those classes right now. He said, because you're going to f fail all of them, and then you won't be eligible to play basketball, and we would have wasted a scholarship on you. And basically re reading me the riot act, about being belligerent, uh, disobedient. And, and finally he said, and this was the thing that ended everything for me, that's the trouble with you colored people. You are ungrateful that white people even allow you to go to their colleges and universities in the first place. Then he told me that my scholarship was gone and, um, and I was finished, you know, as, a, as an athlete, as a basketball player. And he was right. I wish I could have talked to Mel before he went to Oregon State because I think I could have helped him make a decision not to go there. However, his athletic accomplishments pale when compared to his community service accomplishments. Here's a man who was on a path to the NBA, to the National Basketball Association, and he was blocked because he stood up to racism at Oregon State University and racist basketball coaches there. But when I look at it, it was really a benefit to our communities because Mel dedicated himself to education, to public service, putting the community ahead of self-interest. I met Regina through our work at Monterey County Social Services. We were both emergency response social workers where she worked a full-time job eight hours per day giving her heart and her soul into her work. And then in the evening and after hours working toward her Dream of the Village project. When you see the Village project, this stems from a woman who, who dreams large. When I started out as a social worker, seeing nothing in Monterey County for people of African ancestry to deal with mental health needs from a culturally congruent approach. 
And so I literally begged my husband out of his retirement to help with the village project. When we started to the Village Project, we were founding an agency whose uh, primary program was going to be providing psychotherapeutic services. And what we looked at was the myth that black people don't go to therapy. But we also realized that those people who had been historically underserved and unserved uh, by the system had a myriad of other needs. We had kids who were falling through the cracks educationally. <laughs> but they're all very smart, so it's really cool when they're... When they, like, they learn something and that, and like it clicks in their mind and they get it. And it's just... Right, but you have to say one thing interesting that you guys learned today. The Village Project After School program helps the kids have an understanding of who they are, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and having Mel and Regina as mentors over the last 10 years led me on a path of a career in a field where culture is important. We have a young man finishing up his freshman year at Cal State University, Monterey Bay. He's majoring in kinesiology. Uh, and he admitted on uh, the video that you all did that he was doing really poorly in school. They help you with all your, your homework and then they break it down so it's easier to understand. Since I've been coming here, I've been getting like all B's and A's and honor roll. I concentrated more on my work. I was always struggling in math, but now I have a, like a B plus. When their grades started improving, everything else changed for them at school too. Their behavior was better. They walked with their heads up and were smiling more. They were just enjoying life a lot more with the more education that they were getting. Now, I don't work at the program anymore, but I did see a lot of changes in a lot of children. I moved up to San Jose because I was still wanting to go to school. You know, this was in 67. I got a job at a place called Western Electric. But what I noticed there, blacks had been there for seven years without a pay raise. Um, we had people that had applied for positions that they were more than qualified for. They wouldn't get the positions, but then they would be asked to train the white person they got hired how to do the job. You know, it was pretty blatant. The African Americans really didn't get the opportunities that the non-African Americans got. Melvin and I saw one of the supervisors curse one of the African American females out, and he was using some words I can't say. That's when we started to uh, confront some of them about the way they were treating minorities. And then, of course, you know, you had what was going on in the country. And, okay, we got to take matters into our own hands. Otherwise, it's not going to change. So we formed something called the Black Workers Unity Organization. I was a manager and Melvin was an engineer. So this is the first time I think they ever heard of a management employee doing something for the workers. So they started calling in different blacks and telling them, said, now, what's, what's going on here? You know, because you know you're, you're, you're jeopardizing your job. So then a bunch of us would go talk to her boss or his boss. <laughs> said, you, you can't fire people because they have concerns. But I used to always think about Dr. King, Malcolm X, Douglas Carmen, all those people who did so much for social justice, giving their lives for social justice. And all we talking about is forming a union so we could get fair treatment for the African American. And then one evening, there was a knock on the door and uh, there was a guy out there, and he says, uh, Chairman Bobby Seal wanted to invite you to the next Black Panther Party community meeting. I went to that meeting, and I joined. And I know what the media has always tried to portray the Black Panther Party as being. But when we look at, uh, at the example, the, uh, the Free Breakfast for Children program, free medical clinics, blacks had free medical care. <laughs> We also put together the Black Panther Party Community School. We went out and we got black kids who had been labeled uneducable. Some of the children who went through that school were doctors, lawyers, college professors, and corporate executives. But the Oakland Unified School District had deemed them uneducable. So my experience had a profound impact on what became the rest of my life up, up to this point today. Real social work was done in the Black Panther Party. Ashe, go 
the Village Project has a new program called Imenyata. It's Saturday school for children of African ancestry so that kids get to know how great their ancestors were. Okay. Where did the guy named Socrates learn philosophy? Africa. Africa. Where did a guy named Hippocrates learn about medicine? Africa. Africa. Africa, absolutely. That shows how smart your ancestors were. And if your ancestors were smart, then that means we have no reason not to be smart, right? This is a part of the heritage that they gave for us. Looking at black history, Crispus Attucks was credited as being the first person to be killed in the Revolutionary War but was one of the organizers of the Boston Commons demonstrations. He was much more far-reaching and far-thinking than this individual who just happened to maybe accidentally ran into a bullet. He looked ahead and said, if we can win against Britain and this country becomes free, then people who look like me can become free. <laughs>